Inside of the Third Reich and the Nazi Empire, there were very strict ideals for what was expected of women. Hitler and his Nazis wanted women to be housewives, who would give as many children to the Reich as possible, and they were even incentivized to do this through medals and financial rewards and grants. But the wives of the high-ranking top Nazis had very different lives, and they had very diverse and strange relationships with some of the most powerful people across Germany. Many had to share their husbands with mistresses, and had to deal with the fact their husbands had children with other women, away from the marital home, behind their backs. But a number were very loyal to their husbands, and they believed the work of the Nazis that they were doing was for the better. This is a story of the ignorant wives of the top Nazis, and as always, to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. It would be strange to start with any woman but the wife of the Nazi dictator Adolf Hitler. Ava Brown and Hitler had possibly the most depressing marriage in history, as they would be married for around 40 hours before they both lay dead inside of his office underground in the Führerbunker as Berlin crumbled around them. Ava was a long-time companion of the dictator, and she would beat the affections of other women, and she remained always by his side, but she was often in the shadows. Many believed across Germany that Hitler was a single man, but Brown would attempt to take her life twice during the early relationship to ensure Hitler's affections were on her. She lived the rather sheltered life during World War II, and she was known for having different parties in private at Hitler's residences. Hitler wanted to show himself as a chaste single man across the nation, and he was attracted to women who were much younger than him. He and Ava would never appear as a couple in public, and the only time they were together in a published news photo was when she was sat next to him at the 1936 Winter Olympics. She even had her own bedroom at the Berghof and the Führerbunker complex, and this was connected to Hitler's bedchambers via adjoining doors. The influence Ava Brown had over Hitler was very small, and she was kept well away from politics and government business, and she would be told to leave the room when other cabinet ministers were present, and other dignitaries visited Hitler. She was described as feather-brained, and she had different interests to Hitler, but she often stayed up late with him most nights. Public displays of affection between the pair did not really happen, but she took on the role of a hostess inside of the Berghof. She also invited friends to stay with her, but when at the end of the Second World War, it was suggested that she should go into hiding, Ava Brown said, Do you think I would let him die alone? I will stay with him up until the last moment. She did very much this, as Hitler would state in his will that Ava Brown was to receive 12,000 Reichmarks a year following his death. This begs a question, as Hitler possibly believed that Ava Brown would not die with him, as he made these preparations. It's clear that Hitler was fond of Ava, but they would marry inside of the Führerbunker during the Battle of Berlin in the evening of the 28th and 29th of April 1945. Witnessing the marriage was Goebbels and Bormann, and a modest wedding breakfast was then hosted. Ava even changed her legal name to Ava Hitler. But what is interesting is to consider what Ava Hitler knew about the Holocaust and the crimes of the Nazis. As she was kept well away from government business, it's likely that she did not know what was truly happening, but she would possess the anti-Semitic values that the Nazis had. She was often very ignorant to the suffering of many, as there was a great amount of suffering across Europe, caused by the policies of her boyfriend and husband, and her friends, and she was having many parties paid for by the Nazi state, who were profiting from those who were being persecuted. The wife of Heinrich Himmler was Marguerite. She met the head of the SS in 1927, during Himmler's tours, and the pair wrote to each other. She was seven years older than him, and the pair had a number of similar interests. She was very anti-Semitic like her husband, and she would write in early letters to him remarks along these lines, and following their marriage, the pair would live together, and they did have a daughter. But Himmler would become distant in his relationship with his wife, as further work commitments kept him away from the home, and Marguerite was not the most well-liked of the Nazi wives, as she would make enemies in some of the other wives, such as Lena Heydrich. She was described as narrow-minded and humorless, but what she knew about her husband's actions during the war, and in his role as the head of the SS, has been debated for some time. She would work inside of hospitals with the German Red Cross, but her daughter would actually go to visit Dachau concentration camp with her father. But she would continue to state that she did not know the official business of her husband's work, and because of this she was classed as a lesser offender 
in the denazification programmes, but she was an early member of the Nazi party. Marguerite maintained she had been the wife of the head of the SS, but was not informed on the concentration camps or anything, and she said later she was not held accountable for the crimes of her husband. However, it was clear that she and her daughter had benefited from the rise of Himmler and the suffering of others. It's believed that she probably did not know too much about the official secrets of the Nazi party, but she was still a typical Nazi who held disgusting views, and she profited from the suffering of those who were persecuted. One of the most power-hungry men inside of Hitler's inner circle was Martin Bormann, who became the dictator's private secretary. Bormann controlled the access that people had to Hitler, and also arranged his diary. But he had a very complex and strange number of relationships. He met his wife Gerda Busch when she was 17, and he married her when she was underage, and she needed her parents' approval. Hitler was present at the wedding, and she would give birth to 10 children in 13 years, and because of this she was seen as an ideal Nazi woman. She wore traditional German clothes and accepted her husband as her superior, and she never questioned the Nazi policies, and she was in a sense Hitler's perfect woman too. She looked like a Bavarian milkmaid at times, preferring the traditional folk style of dress, however Martin Bormann preferred the company of many other women, including the actress Manja Behrens. This left Gerda on her own raising her children in what would have been a very noisy and chaotic household, but she accepted this duty as a German mother, and she believed her sacrifice was for the German Reich. Gerda Bormann was not the main person on her husband's mind, but she lived a life of luxury in her sprawling Alpine-style home. She also was close to Hitler's Berghof, and had many servants who helped her raise her children, but family events were even attended by Uncle Adolf, who visited for some birthdays and parties but her main concern was the extramarital affairs her husband was having. She may have even at one point suggested that her mistress and her should take turns bearing Martin Bormann's children to give her years off between pregnancies. She must have known of this about the Nazi Lebensborn programme and the belief of more children the better for the Reich and Empire. She was a woman very much on the edge of her husband's desires and attention and Bormann was known for having many affairs and mistresses and Gerda believed that this was a healthy expression of her husband's virility and his need to reproduce and make more children for Hitler's empire. Bormann would confess he was madly in love with his mistress, but Gerda even suggested that they should begin a polygamous household as mentioned. She even allegedly drew up a contract around this, which would have given his mistress the same rights as his wife, and she thought there should be a law in which Nazi men should be able to have more than one wife. She would even invite Manja to move in. However, Gerda Bormann died at the age of 27 of uterine cancer inside of an Italian prison in 1946. Magda Goebbels, before she met her future Nazi husband, would be married to a rich German industrialist twice her age. However, when she was attending a meeting of the Nazi party shortly after her divorce, she was impressed and captivated by a very short man who whipped the crowd up into a frenzy. This was Joseph Goebbels, the future Minister of Propaganda and close friend of Adolf Hitler, and Goebbels at the time was a Gauleiter of Berlin. Magda joined the Nazi party, and Hitler would encourage their relationship, and he referred to Magda as the First Lady of the Third Reich, and Magda actually had a very close relationship with Adolf Hitler, and was believed to have been the closest friend and confidant of the dictator. Some have even suggested that Hitler may have wanted Magda for himself, and Josef would write in his diary that, she loses herself a bit around the boss. I am suffering greatly. I did not sleep a wink. Following the marriage of the Goebbelses on the 19th of December 1931, they went on to have six children, all of whom had the names beginning with the letter H to honour Hitler. The pair got a lot of benefits from their close friendship with the dictator, but Josef, in his work inside of the propaganda ministry, would have a very wandering eye, and he would regularly sleep with many of the actresses he was employing in films and in other projects. Goebbels pursued director Lena Riefenstahl and was inappropriate towards her whilst watching an opera, and also in 1938 he struck up a very serious affair with Czech actress Lida Barova. He would admit this relationship to Magda, and he asked if the three would be able to coexist together, and Magda did agree, and Josef even booked a trip for the three of them together. However, Magda Goebbels was growing more unhappy, and she wanted a divorce, and Hitler banned this, 
and forced Joseph Goebbels to break off with his mistress, and he forced them to reconcile. But Magda Goebbels was a woman who was an ardent Nazi, and she would have known about what was happening inside of the Third Reich, if not from the mouth of Hitler himself. As his confidant, it's likely that he spoke to her about a great deal of things, and she was a woman who held the disgusting Nazi beliefs and ideas. She was a fanatical supporter of Hitler, and she along with her husband would remain inside of the bunker during the final days of the conflict. She knew that she did not want to live in a world without Hitler, and she knew she would die alongside the dictator and her close friend. She was even offered chances to save her children and to smuggle them out of Berlin in the final days of the conflict in April 1945, but Magda then made the decision to kill these children, and she would poison them along with an SS doctor inside of the Führerbunker whilst they were being given a sedative. She would die alongside her husband shortly after. She was very much an ardent Nazi who probably knew, as mentioned, the horrors of the Third Reich. But what is interesting is that some did get an exit visa, which was provided by Magda Goebbels, to escape persecution. But Magda would also criticise Hitler in secret, and she would claim that he no longer listens to voices of reason. Those who tell him what he wants to hear are the only ones he believes. The first thing to mention when discussing the wives of Hermann Göring is the fact he was actually married twice. His first wife was a Swedish lady named Karin, and she was a very ill lady who suffered from tuberculosis in her early 40s. She travelled to her mother's funeral in 1931, but when she got there she succumbed to heart failure on the 17th of October 1931. Karin's death came as a huge blow to Göring, and he would build a huge hunting lodge and name it Karinhall after her. He filled his home with images of her, and even created an altar in her memory, which stayed even as he remarried. Karin did follow her husband in being a member of the Nazi party, and she would be instrumental in helping him recover following the failed Munich Beerhold Putsch of November 1923. Göring had been injured and been shot in the groin during a shootout with police, and Göring then travelled to Italy with his wife and she nursed him back to health. But this love story was then used in propaganda by the Nazis, and the couple toured the country and spoke of their relationship, boosting the popularity of the Nazis. Her knowledge of the Nazi policies and the brutal regime is not the most commentable, due to the fact she died before the Nazis really established their power. But Göring would remarry, and in 1935 he married Emmy Göring, who would become considered Adolf Hitler's hostess at many state functions, and she was seen in the eyes of many as the real First Lady of the Third Reich. Emmy gave birth to a daughter named Edda, and she was named after the eldest child of Benito Mussolini. Emmy served as the female face of high-status Nazi occasions, which led to her attracting criticism and hatred from other women, such as Ava Brown. Hitler would state to Göring that he wanted Emmy to treat Ava with more respect, and Emmy was actually banned from staying at Hitler's mountain retreat, the Berghof. She was the wife of one of the richest and most powerful men in Europe, and she benefited from the lavish lifestyle. One thing to consider, though, is that her home was decorated with hundreds, if not thousands, of pieces of stolen art, which had been appropriated from Jewish families and Jewish art dealers, and those who were being persecuted by the Nazis. She must have known where these works came from, and she must have been told about what the Nazis were doing, possibly as her husband would brag about this. Following her husband's execution, Emmy was actually subjected to time in prison, and she would lose 30% of her property. It's believed she as a hostess in Hitler's functions, rubbed shoulders with many of the most evil war criminals, but she must have had knowledge as to what the Nazis were truly up to. Lena Heydrich met her future husband Reinhard in December 1930, when she was 19, and the couple married a year later. Lena was an ardent Nazi, who persuaded her husband to work inside of the SS, and she saw this as a good career option for him, following when he was sacked from the Navy. Heydrich would become incredibly influential inside of the SS, and he was a very close friend of Heinrich Himmler, and he founded the SD, the Sicker Heidenst, the intelligence organisation that sought out resistance groups and those who opposed the Nazi party. His actions resulted in the arrests and deportations of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people, and Hitler even regarded Heydrich as a man with the Iron Heart. Lena, though, was a member of the Nazi party herself, but she was a ruthless woman. One of her children was killed in an accident 
where he was hit by a truck, which hit him coming down a road, and Lena would demand that all the passengers and the driver should be dragged out and shot and executed. But Lena Heydrich benefited greatly from the deadly work her husband was doing, as Hitler would give Lena a country estate, and she would sell all her other properties and become incredibly wealthy, even following the death of Heydrich, her husband. She would be known for having dozens of prisoners on her estate, conducting slave labour, and she also witnessed and she was also witnessed abusing these many times. She would at the end of the war be entitled to a substantial pension, and she was actually tried in absentia, and was sentenced to life imprisonment by a Czech court. And then she would later go on to run her former husband's summer house as a restaurant. Rudolf Hess's involvement in the Second World War was a strange and turbulent one. Hess would rise to the rank of Deputy Führer, meaning if Hitler was ever incapacitated, he would have stepped into the position of the dictator. But whilst he was 26 years old, he met a young schoolgirl named Ilse Pröll. Ilse was smitten with Hess, but Hess refused a relationship, and the couple dated for a number of years, and he showed little interest physically in his wife. But Ilse would write, We are anti-Semites, constantly rigorous, without exception. It was Hitler who pushed the pair to marry. They did eventually tie the knot, and they moved into a small Munich apartment, but Rudolf Hess still would not get really physical with his wife to the point where she felt like a convent nun. The couple did have a child named Wolf, of which was Hitler's animal codename. But Hess would embark on his flight to Britain, on allegedly a one-man peace mission, and when he was arrested he was proclaimed mad by Hitler. Hess was at the end of the war sentenced to life imprisonment, and he remained inside of Spandau prison in Berlin. Ilse Hess, who spent a year in prison herself, continued to correspond and write with her husband, she would also visit him with her son a number of times. Following Hess's flight, the concentration camps and the final solution would be implemented, and it's unlikely that Ilse Hess knew much about this, as she would be miles away from the heart of the Nazi government, and her husband had found himself ostracised by Hitler and his government, and was said to have been mad. Each of the Nazi princesses and the wives of the high-ranking Nazis had very different lives with their husbands. Some embraced their roles in high society, but every single one of them benefited from their husband's status, and with this benefited from the suffering of others. They also received a lot of financial wealth or property, which had been stolen from the persecuted. But one person to mention is the wife of one high-ranking Nazi, who would actually go toe-to-toe with Hitler on the matter of the suffering of the Holocaust. Henny von Chirac would confront Hitler about the plight of the Jews, and he would brazenly respond with, that's all I need, you coming to me with this sentimental twaddle, what concern are those Jewish women to you? It was an icy exchange, and the Chiracs were never invited to the Berghof again. So there were some Nazi wives who did try to stand up, but most turned a blind eye to what was happening, and the work of their evil husbands. Thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe, and once again, Thank you so much for watching.